What do I do? My faith is almost gone. I want to believe. I just don't know how. I've read it. But it's hard to believe what I can't see. I'm trying to hear you speak. But I don't know what you sound like. This July at Mavuno Church, discover what it means to develop the kind of faith that drives out doubt. A twist of faith. afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever you're watching us from. Uh, welcome to Mavuno Church, Karibu Sana, as we say in East Africa. We are so glad uh, that you're able to join us for our worship experience uh, today. And uh, we're, we're starting an interesting sermon series uh, this month. Uh, we're studying it today, and we're calling it A Twist of Faith. A twist of faith. Uh, one of the things we know is that this year, uh, uh, God, uh, you know, uh, one of the promises God has given us as a community of faith is that he will build in us unshakable faith. And this month what we are asking is, is it possible? Is it possible for us to live and walk in a faith that can address our impossible situations? A faith that can enter into every circumstance in our lives that seems impossible to us and lead to a, a, you know, a, you know, a transition and a shift and a change. That's what we'll be looking at this month. We'll be looking at some incredible faith stories. We'll be looking at the lives of some uh, individuals in the scriptures who engaged their faith and their faith obtained for them some dramatic significant results. I want us to talk about, uh, you know, overcoming faith, faith that overcomes impossibility. That's what we're talking about today. And we'll be reading from the book of Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. It's an interesting story. Uh, we're going to read from verse 14 to verse 29. And I'm reading in the New Living Translation. This is what the Bible says. When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about? Jesus asked. One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground, writhing and, and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy and help us if you can. What do you mean if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A mama ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet and he stood up. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. A close reading of this story gives us the very clear, you know, gives us some eye-popping, you know, details. But the, the clear impression you can find is that this story is anchored in a heartbreaking, uh, you know, account of suffering. 
It's about a boy, a son, who is going through tremendous pain and anguish and suffering, and his father, who is desperate to get for him an intervention. That's at the heart of this story. It's clear from our reading that this man specifically came to seek out Jesus. He came and brings his son because he was persuaded that what was needed was a miraculous intervention, but he's also persuaded that the person from whom or through whom that miracle will come is Jesus. And, and so, you know, he comes and brings the boy to Jesus. And, and as we look at this story, I want to consider, a conver you know, two sort of conversations that you see in the reading that we have read. The first is Jesus' interaction with his disciples. And the second is his interaction with his father who has brought his son. Let's look at the disciples first. The conversation here is brief, but it's quite striking. It is a simple, clear, and I would say, in my opinion, relatively harsh rebuke in fact it was very brief but it was very strong listen to what jesus said uh, it says in from verse 17 to verse 19 one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said teacher i brought to you my son he introduces the conversation and in verse 19 jesus speaks to the disciples and these were his words jesus said to them you faithless people how long must i be with you how long must i put up with you bring the boy to me you faithless people. That's what Jesus said. How long must I be with you? When Jesus learned that his disciples were unable to cast out this demon, he seems to have been deeply disappointed and he rebukes them for their lack of faith. He says to them, why is it that you are unable to believe for this miracle that this child needs? And I ask myself, why is his criticism so harsh? And, and it's because that's what it sounds like to me. Is Jesus one of those, you know, harsh leaders? Is he one of those people who just directly, you know, explodes at the people, at his team, the people that he's leading? And I, and I, and I thought about it a little bit. And I found the answer. And I realized, I think the answer lies in something that had happened before this interaction. And so I'm going to take us back to the book of, uh, to chapter 6 of this same book, the book of Mark, and we're going to read several verses, verse 7 of Mark chapter 6, and then I'll jump to verse 12 and verse 13. And here's what it says. And he called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. Verse 12 continues, so the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. Now listen to verse 13 of Mark chapter 6. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. This changed my perspective of Jesus' rebuke. You see, reading this helped me understand or helped me see their lack of faith in a new light because two things had already happened. That's what I see in this story. Two things have already happened before the disciples had this encounter with his father and his son. Number one, there is authority that the disciples had already received from Jesus. That's what it says. When Jesus sent them out, it expressly says he gave them the authority. And so they were operating in, with a certain level of permission, the certain level of authority from Jesus, and they, had been, they were able to operate in that authority. That's the first thing. They had received authority. The second thing is this. They had already exercised it. If they had cast out this demon that was oppressing this boy, it would not have been their first time casting out an evil spirit. In fact, the Bible tells us that when they were sent out, it says they cast out many evil spirits and many people were healed. For many of us facing impossible situations today, uh, you know, you're, you've probably wondered, how do I get through this? How do I work this out? Many of us have an impossible situation in our own lives. Many of us, if not all of us, have someone we care about who is facing an impossible situation that they need to address. We desire an intervention for them. We desire for something to break through for them. And, we are not, and, and nothing has happened yet. And we're not sure how to proceed. This is my question to you as you watch this. Have you engaged your faith in that situation? Have you believed God for an intervention? You see, I find that many times my first response is, how can I solve this problem? Is to run around helter-skelter, is to, you know, for my mind to run full speed ahead as I'm trying to figure out, okay, this is, you know, plan A, plan B, plan C. And the question today is, have you engaged your faith on account of that impossibility? Whether it is in your own life or you're engaging your faith, standing in the gap, as they say, believing for someone who needs an impossible situation resolved in their life. 
Yeah. I see that Jesus was disappointed that, 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 that the disciples were unable to engage their faith in a way that translated into a result and an outcome for uh, this little boy and for the father who had brought his son. That's the first conversation. The first conversation is brief and striking, a brief and striking rebuke from Jesus to his disciples. Now, I don't want you to hear condemnation here, and because I'll explain it to you in a little bit, I'll, 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 you know, we will kind of see a, a possibility of why it is uh, that the disciples' faith was shaken, because I think the answer is there. So I want you to hold on to that, but I wanted to highlight that as the first conversation. It's between Jesus and his disciples. The bigger part of this interaction and this scripture, this portion of scripture that we've read, actually records the interaction between Jesus and this boy's father. And I'm going to read from verse 17. It says, one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He introduces this boy, he introduces his son, and he talks about his affliction. He says he has an evil spirit that won't let him talk. He says when the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground, and he foams at the mouth, he grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. I think he's describing here what we would call today a seizure, uh, you know, in, in medical terms. Uh, uh, this, that sounds like what this is to me. He grinds his teeth, he becomes rigid. And he says, so I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. In verse 22, uh, you know, he, sort of, he says it a, a little more. He says, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us, this man says to Jesus. Help us if you can. In these verses, I want to draw to your attention a very peculiar transition. I don't know if you caught it, but there, there's some, you know, it moves very fast, but there's a very interesting transition that I see here. This is how the conversation began. The man comes with his son. The only reason he brings his son must be that he's fully persuaded that Jesus can heal him. He's fully persuaded. In fact, he's so persuaded that he says to Jesus, oh, I was bringing my son to you, but you are not here. I'm so persuaded I asked your disciples to heal him. That's his level of persuasion. He's 100% certain. Now, I don't know how he got there. Maybe he had heard stories. Maybe he had even had an interaction with Jesus. Maybe he had been there when Jesus had cast out evil spirits, had healed a blind person. I don't know. But for some reason, he has 100% certainty. The only thing my son needs to be set free from this pain and this suffering is an interaction with Jesus. And when he doesn't find Jesus, I presume maybe he had heard the stories that we are talking about in Mark chapter 6 of the miracles the disciples had performed, the healings that had come, and more importantly, the many evil spirits that they had had the authority to cast out. And so he's not shaken. He says, oh, Jesus isn't here. Oh, I know. You guys can resolve this issue for me. So I see that that's where he started. He started from a place where he was fully and totally persuaded. So this is a transition that I see. He says to Jesus, heal my son. And the words he uses are help us. But he adds a little phrase back there that some of you may know. He says, help us if you can. How did this shift happen? What's this about? How does he move from, I am so persuaded I have brought my son all the way to you. I am so persuaded that not finding you, I gave him to your disciples. How does he move from that level of persuasion to uh, please help us if you can, if it is within your power? What happened there? And I want to share with you the two reasons that I think are, are the reason why he has shifted from total and complete persuasion to a place of I'm not so sure, maybe you can. If you can, please resolve this for me. The first reason is an obvious reason. And the reason is this, that the disciples had failed. Having come with 100% certainty that this issue could be resolved and this was the location for its resolution, his theory, his confidence, it sort of falls apart based on the reality that this mission did not succeed. The disciples were unable to cast out this demon. Maybe you know what this is like. You could be watching this and this is your reality today. That at some point you came to Jesus with a need and you were fully persuaded Jesus is the answer. That was, you know, your conviction as you came before him in prayer, maybe even with fasting, and you sought him, and you knew that this is where your answer lay. But the need 
was not resolved and you felt that Jesus didn't come through for you. And so now, anytime you need to come to Jesus, you approach him with an if you can sort of perspective. That you, 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 you love him, you, 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 you know that he's God, but you're not quite sure, can he intervene in my situation? Are my struggles some of the things that Jesus is available to resolve? Maybe as you watch this, you're in that same place that this man was at. Having started with full persuasion, your faith has shrunk a little bit and you're wondering, can Jesus actually do it? That's the first thing that I see. I see that the disciples failed and for that reason, this man's confidence was shaken. But the second thing I see is this, that the boy had not one, but two seizures during this father's interaction with Jesus. Listen to verse 20. It says, so they brought the boy, so they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child, listen to this, into a violent convulsion. And he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. When the spirit screamed in verse 26 again, when Jesus tells the spirit to leave, listen to this response. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent conversion. Another one, the second time since the father and Jesus started interacting. It threw him into another violent conversion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A mama ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. You see, the moment Jesus began a conversation with this man regarding his son, the demon demonstrated its power over the boy by throwing him into a convulsion. The demon broke out. It demonstrates that it is powerful. It demonstrates that it has authority. It has the ability to inflict significant suffering on this, on this child. The demon manifested. I think that's the word that we probably would use today. It was seeking to show that it was powerful. And I suspect that this is the second reason the man's persuasion was shaken. Maybe he looks and he sees the demon, uh, you, know, you know, doing, throwing his son into convulsions. And this man wonders, is Jesus more powerful than this demon? Is Jesus more powerful than this entity that is clearly showing its power, you know, in my son's life by inflicting this depth of suffering? These are practical, physical things that are happening right before his eyes. And I think he watched it and he thought, maybe Jesus doesn't have as much power as it will take to get rid of this, of this demon. And so his faith is shaken, his persuasion is shaken, and he now comes to Jesus and he says, please help us if you can. He's no longer as sure as he was before. Maybe you've experienced this before. Maybe you've entered a situation fully persuaded that Jesus can intervene, that the power of God is sufficient to completely transform your situation. You engaged your faith full, you know, full steam ahead, you engaged prayer full steam ahead. You were praying. You were waiting on God, fully persuaded. But something happened that seemed to demonstrate the impossibility or to magnify the impossibility of your situation. You started to pray for your parents' business because you could tell they were struggling financially. But things moved from bad to worse and maybe their business broke down eventually. Now you're unsure of Jesus' willingness or his ability to intervene in impossible situations. Maybe it was, a mar it was their marriage that was in trouble. And so you prayed for them and you spent years praying for them. But eventually the marriage even fell apart. And your persuasion about Jesus and what he can do for you is not as firm as it used to be. Maybe you prayed for a loved one who was extremely unwell. But the more you prayed, the worse things got. Maybe your loved one even, even passed on. And now you're just not sure what were the prayers about. Why did I believe if nothing was going to be transformed anyway? Maybe it's your own marriage that's in trouble. And the more you pray, it seems, the worse things get. And you've prayed and things have gotten worse. And you've prayed more and you've fasted more. But it appears that things keep getting worse. And so here you are as you listen to, to, to this message your faith, your persuasion in Jesus' willingness, his ability to intervene is shaken and you're not so sure and you're approaching Jesus wondering if you can please intervene in my situation. I see from this story that sometimes the enemy is committed to demonstrating his power in the situations where he has taken a position to oppress us and to stand up against our loved ones. But this story is a great story and this is why this story has an amazing 
incredible ending. It has an amazing ending because this dad is able to obtain victory for his son. The, this, this story ends with the son being set free. The Bible says Jesus told, the, you know, commanded, instructed the demon to leave. But not just that, he said, leave him and never return to him again. His oppression came to an end permanently. This pain and this suffering that he has experienced since he was a little boy, which was his father's testimony, it came to an end. And I want to draw your attention as we bring this message to a close to how I believe that this, this victory came how did this victory came about and there's a in this interaction with jesus uh you know there's something that the father said that i believe is where we can see a faith that overcomes impossibility even when the enemy is going out of his way to demonstrate his power to demonstrate his authority how do you get to a faith that can overcome those impossibilities? The situation itself, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, when the enemy sort of seems to accelerate or increase the demonstrations of his power, how do you still overcome that reality to get to a place where on account of your faith, you can receive intervention in impossible situations? I believe that the anchor is in the Father's words to Jesus. Jesus responds to him and he says, what do you mean if I can What's happened to you? You brought your son to me. Are you unsure now about my ability to resolve this situation? And so he says to him, anything is possible if you believe. And I believe that this is the answer, where the answer lies for us in, in, in verse 24 of our reading in Mark chapter 9. He says, the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. You see, this man somehow had understood something. He needed faith. That thing that Jesus rebuked the disciples for, he needed faith. And this man says, I do believe. In fact, my faith is what brought me here. But he also understood that in addition to believing, in addition to having faith, he needed to overcome unbelief. He needed to overcome unbelief. And I want to take you back to that rebuke, that sharp rebuke, that rebuke that sounded harsh to me, uh, to the disciples, I, 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 I sort of came to understand, I think I have an idea of what had happened with the disciples. I asked, I asked myself, when Jesus starts to interact with this man, when Jesus commands a demon to flee, in both of those instances, the boy gets into a seizure, a violent convulsion, as the Bible calls it. And I thought to myself, I wonder whether this happened when the disciples attempted to cast out the demon. I wonder whether the boy got into a violent convulsion. I wonder whether the disciples, you know, having come and entered that prayer or this engagement with full persuasion, whether the demon had demonstrated its power and that had so just enough, you know, uh, uh, unbelief in their hearts to stand in the way of their being able to cast out the demon. You see, maybe that's what happens to us today as well. That the issue is not so much that we do not have faith, that our faith is perfect, our faith is bold, but the enemy has done some things that have sowed seeds of unbelief in our lives. And that unbelief, this man had the wisdom. Somehow, I don't know how he understands, how he understood it, but he, under, he knew to say, I'm trusting you for a miracle, but I can see there are some seeds of unbelief. I can see that there, there are things that are, that are happening that are causing me to say, if you can, where that was not my attitude initially. And so I see that this man understands that he needed two things in order to get this miracle. He needed faith persuasion, full persuasion that Jesus could intervene in his situation and deliver his son. But he also needed to overcome the unbelief that the enemy had managed to sow into his life. Maybe the disciples weren't so faithless after all. Maybe they had seen this demon manifest or, you know, cause this seizure, this conversion. Maybe they hadn't encountered that before. And, and it just became a seed of unbelief, uh, something that shook their persuasion. And now they weren't sure. They started to question the authority that Jesus had given them. And they started to wonder whether they were able, they had the authority to cast out this demon. We're talking about unshakable faith. We're talking about how we can live our lives in a way that obtains impossible results in the situations where we need God to intervene for us. I see that these are the two things that this man needed in order to receive or to obtain this miracle for his son. He needed to have faith and he needed to overcome unbelief. 
He needed to believe and be fully persuaded that Jesus could do the things that he, that he needed him to do. But he also needed to address the unbelief. Those things that had become questions. Those things that had caused him to wonder. I know that Jesus can intervene, but can he intervene in my situation? I know that Jesus has power, but is that power available to me or is it available to other people only? Is it available to a situation like this? Is this situation too difficult? He needed to find an answer to that unbelief. And so he says to Jesus, I have faith, but I need some help with my unbelief. So how do we grow in our faith? We do two things. This is how you need to, to get into overcoming faith. Faith that breaks through barriers and enters into a place of receiving miracles and interventions in impossible situations. The first thing you need to do is to build your faith. Hey, if you have a neighbor next to you, you can nudge them a little bit and tell them, build your faith. This is what you need to do. And, and it's very simple. I'm going to tell you how. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says to us, so faith comes from hearing. That is, hearing the good news about Christ. You need to be in places where you're constantly hearing, you're constantly receiving, understanding, knowledge, wisdom about who Jesus is. Listen, I'm fully persuaded about this and I'll tell you why. Because this man would not have, have been here trusting God for a miracle for his son if he had not heard some things about Jesus. It's how the story starts in the first place. He had had some things and they had persuaded him. If I bring my son to this man, his suffering will come to an end. What are you hearing about Jesus? Are you constantly, deliberately, diligently in spaces where you can hear about Jesus, in spaces where your faith can be built up, in spaces where you can understand God's will for your life and his love for you, the good news about Jesus. That's what the Bible says. You need to be in a place where you're hearing the good news about Jesus. And I have a simple proposition for you. The first thing you need to do is you need to interact with the scriptures for yourself. You need to be in the habit and the lifestyle of reading through the Bible. And as, as a Mavuno church family, who are reading through the New Testament this year. And, and we started in January and it's been an incredible, incredible journey. I don't know where you're at. If you didn't get manage to get on, there's an easy way for you to get onto the Bible reading plan. And you can continue reading with us from where we have reached. There's going to be, there's a number coming down on your screen. And that number will help you join our WhatsApp community as the Mavuno Church family. And every week, uh, there's a text that's sent out on our WhatsApp community and it has all the readings for that week and so don't worry if you didn't start off with us in January you can be updated every week what the readings are and you're able to uh, you know to keep track together with us but secondly on our website mavunochurch.org mavunochurch.org uh, you know that's gonna come uh, on your screen as well uh, every week they upload the readings for the week ahead and so you're able to dive right in and to join us in reading through the New Testament you can start right where we are you don't need to even wait for tomorrow you can read today's readings after watching this message and then you can continue from there you need to build your faith and you build your faith by hearing hearing about Jesus learning about Jesus hearing the good news knowing who Jesus is and what his intentions for you are but the second thing that this that you need to do in order to to, to grow get into this space where you can receive miraculous intervention for your impossible situations the second thing you need to do is to overcome and belief. You need to build your faith, but you also need to overcome and believe. Let me ask you again, if you have a neighbor, you can nudge them a little bit and tell them, overcome and believe. That's the second thing that you need to do. You see, this story ended in an interesting statement. This is what it says, verse 20, uh, 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 this is what it says at the end. Afterward, uh, verse 28 to verse 29, afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? You see, they, they, they are, they're also perplexed. They're like, we've seen it work before. We used the same words, we pointed the same finger, but this time it didn't work. What was the issue? And Jesus says to them, this kind can only be cast out only by prayer. Some versions say only by prayer and fasting. I believe that this is the key to overcoming unbelief. That, that the, the reason that Jesus was talking about prayer, the reason some, some you know, versions have translated it as prayer and fasting, is not, is not so much that, that, that you need more prayer to receive a miracle. It is that you need more prayer to help you overcome your unbelief. 
in that moment when the enemy demonstrates his power and he breaks out and there's that violent convulsion as he's seeking to shake you in your persuasion that Jesus is able to intervene in your situation. In that moment, the way you overcome the seeds of unbelief is by coming from a place of deliberate, intense, consistent, relentless prayer. You need to make prayer a part of your lifestyle. You need to make prayer a part of your rhythm. And so I have a second invitation for you. As the Mavuno family, we, we, we have built in a rhythm of prayer uh, uh, for us as a church community. And so every weekday, Monday to Friday, uh, we wake up early in the morning, uh, uh, you know, at 4.30 in the morning, and we gather together uh, for a virtual prayer meeting from 4.30 to 5.30 in the morning. And some links are going to come up on your screen so you can join us wherever you are. And we come together and we wait on God and we trust God together as a community for the impossible situations that we are facing in our lives. I believe that this will help you enter into a space where you're able to uh, receive miraculous breakthrough, divine intervention that will conquer every impossibility that you face, just like this man did. You need to build your faith and you need to overcome unbelief. Get into the habit of prayer. Get into the habit of reading the scriptures. And in that way, you will be able to live a life that is victorious and to live a life where your, your, your faith is unshakable and resilient and will go the distance for you. Allow me to pray for you as we bring this message to a close. Our God and our King, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you because you desire to give us victory. I'm persuaded you desire for me to be victorious than I desire to be victorious. And that is the case for every person listening to this message at this time. I pray, my Lord and my King, that you will help us enter into rhythms that help us build our faith and that help us overcome and belief. I pray that our God and our King, we will be found in a place where we are constantly seeking to grow our faith by, by, by being in the scriptures, learning about you, hearing about you, reading the Bible for ourselves so that our faith can increase. But secondly, I pray Lord that you help us enter into rhythms of prayer, of seeking you through prayer, uh, uh, you know, individually and in community so that we can get to that place where Jesus said that, that, that when, when this, the, the enemy comes up against us and is resisting us, Prayer is the answer and through prayer we will be able to overcome and believe and we will be able to receive every victory that we desire from you. We thank you Lord for loving us and I thank you for every impossible situation that you're addressing at this time even as we hear this message. I thank you for every prayer that will be answered as we come before you in faith and as we respond uh, to the unbelief that has become a part of our lives. We commit ourselves to you in all things. In Jesus name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We pray that you continue to be with us uh, through the rest of the month as we continue to talk about unshakable faith, faith that can obtain results in impossible situations. God bless you and have a wonderful week ahead.